Hi everyone. So, uh, as promised, I'm putting out this video on global macroeconomic trends. Uh, I thought this would be a good idea, to, a good way to essentially help you identify what big trends are happening around the world and briefly discuss how those might affect uh, stock and bond prices. So, what I'll do is I'll go through uh, several different uh, topics. So we'll start out with the US outlook. I'll talk about the Chinese market, which is going through some pretty big changes. Same thing with the Eurozone or the EU. Uh, I'll talk about how the war in Ukraine is affecting markets, and then I'll wrap up with emerging markets. Uh, once I've done all of that, what I'll do is I'll give you my recommendation or my outlook for specifically stock prices uh, going forward. So let's go ahead and get into it. Okay, so we took a look at a lot of the data that you know I have on these slides, but first off, let's talk about the U.S. outlook. You know, we we recently saw that inflation is quite high as of right now in the U.S. Uh, as of the time that I put together this this bullet point, eight, inflation was eight point three percent year over year. So uh, obviously, you know, prices increased on average by eight point three percent. You know, from last year to this year, uh, we also found in class that uh, current GDP is still positive. I mean, GDP growth is still positive or was it in the fourth quarter. Uh, we actually experienced a uh, technical recession in, during the summer, spring and summer of 2022. Uh, but as far as consumer prices go or inflation goes, uh, inflation is expected to decline. And what I mean by that is that we have what's called disinflation. So if I go over to the consumer prices that, you know, thank, thanks to the group that pulled that, uh, notice here that we've got this, you know, if prices were increasing, so the change in CPI was positive. Uh, in December, we saw our first month where it actually had a negative change month over month. And so uh, the big takeaway here is that uh, inflation is expected to still be positive going forward, but it's expected to be lower than, say, 8.3%. So it's expected to be something like uh, 3%. So I'll just, I will put up the actual numbers that uh, the group that had that showed. Uh, so, yeah, so CPI expected to be about 3.7% next year. So this is what we call disinflation, where it's still positive, uh, year over year, but uh, it's it's decreasing. That that change is positive, but decreasing relative to what it was. Okay, uh, other things that we can expect. Well, the Fed did just raise interest rates to the Fed funds rate target to between 4.5 and 4.75. So raising interest rates, the goal here is to uh, decrease the incentive that individuals and businesses have to borrow. So it should cool down the economy. It should cool interest in uh, receiving loans. So this could hopefully tamp down inflation. Uh, as of right now, the expected benchmark rate uh, is, well, uh, is expected to be 5.31% in May. So we are, as analysts, expecting interest rates to continue to increase, but at a slower rate than they've increased in the past year. So, you know, in the past year, we've seen these 50 basis point increases on the, the Fed funds rate, uh, you know, uh, expect that to slow down. I don't think we're going to see a, a, a Fed funds rate cut anytime soon, though, or at least not for the next couple of months. Okay, uh, the next thing I want to point out is that uh, last November, the infrastructure bill, or IBJA, passed. Uh, this was a bill that was designed to essentially help build out infrastructure in the United States. I guess that was uh, November 2021. Anyway, uh, what it did was it provided a large amount of uh, funding for all kinds of projects, roads, rail, port, broadband, clean water spending, uh, and then also uh, renewable energy. So what the end result of this was that a large amount of money, uh, several hundreds of billions of dollars, got pushed into the U.S. economy, and that arguably contributed to this, this high inflation number that we've seen in the last year. Also of note, job openings. I mean, I think You've probably seen this in your own life, but you know, right now the unemployment rate is quite low. So pulling the data from the group that that had it, uh, yeah, we've seen essentially a decline in unemployment claims year over year. So what this this metric says is that uh, from 
this week last year to this week this year, uh, unemployment claims declined 14.5% year over year. So this is a very good thing. Unemployment is decreasing, or it has been decreasing uh, for a while. Uh, and the benefit here is that when you have a tight labor market, typically wages rise. And so what we would expect going forward is that wages might continue to rise, which is you know good for all of you that are you know hopefully entering the job market in the not too distant future. And individuals should have more savings. Okay, uh, what's happening at the federal level, or at least with uh, respect to politics? Well, as of right now, there is what we call political gridlock, meaning that uh, both parties, both you know the Democrats and the Republicans, they control separate. Uh, chambers of Congress. So the Republicans control the House, the Democrats control the Senate and the White House. And pretty much every economist, every analyst worth their salt is predicting that there's going to be gridlock for at least the next election cycle, so two years. And what I mean by that is that not a whole lot of very, very important legislation is going to get passed. Uh, this usually just devolves into bickering, quite frankly. Uh, if you want some information on what might happen politically, I prefer to look at betting markets. There's a good betting market called Predict It, where you can actually bet money on outcomes of like elections, et cetera. Uh, you know, so it's these have tended to be more accurate than a lot of the polls that you see put out there. Uh, another thing that is on our radar is the possibility of a U.S. default on its its Treasury uh, security. So it's T bonds, T bills, T notes. This has a very very low probability. Uh, basically, there's the possibility of a debt fight. So in the U.S., in order to uh, raise new funds or issue new debt, uh, we do have to ensure that that new funding, that the new debt that gets issued, does not exceed the current debt ceiling. And uh, in order to raise that debt ceiling, Congress has to you know, pass a law to raise it to another generally higher level. Uh, what ends up happening is that this becomes a negotiation tactic for you know whatever the minority party is. Uh, and so what we'd expect is that over the next couple of months, there could be a, a debate as to what, uh, what funding gets cut. Uh, essentially, the Republican Party in the House is talking about you know, trying to cut social services, uh, various other specific line items. And we could be setting up for a fight, uh, a budget fight, not too distant future, where essentially one party threatens to, you know, let the U.S. default on its its debt. Uh, I, I think that's a very low probability of, you know, actually occurring. Uh, another thing on our radar: supply chain issues. So uh, right now, supply chain backups have continued. They've kind of lessened recently, but really, any firm that has a, a large amount of their supply chain running through China they're facing some difficult times. So if you saw the news recently uh, with Apple, uh, Apple announced that a large portion of their inability to meet or exceed earnings expectations was due to supply chain issues in China. Uh, so iPhones are produced in uh, generally one city in China, or basically every iPhone is has to go through one city in China. Uh, so if you have supply chain backups due to COVID lockdowns, that can really hurt your ability to produce enough iPhones to sell. Also, fintech regulation is catching up to the, the actual technology. So you've probably heard a lot of news about you know, potential regulation that would restrict certain fintech products. Uh, in the past couple of years, fintech has benefited from regulators just not knowing enough about fintech. And so what's ended up happening is you have companies that offer new financial products and services, but you know, regulators aren't cracking down because there's no law in the books that they could really use to go after, you know, unscrupulous business practices from a lot of those fintech firms. Well, in the past year or so, there's been more talks about, uh, you know, actual uh, regulation and legislation to prevent certain unethical activities from occurring in the fintech space. Uh, one other thing I should note, commodity prices are high. So I know we talked about this in our class, but if I go down to uh, consumer prices, I wanted to highlight a couple of things. Notably, certain products, we've seen a decline in the price, you know, thankfully bacon. Then uh, eggs, I think everyone's probably heard or seen this in the grocery store. Price of eggs has skyrocketed. 
this is partially due to uh, you know just increased demand, but a large portion of this is due to uh, you know the culling of chickens. So uh, last couple of months there have been a sev several outbreaks of diseases on chicken farms, and so a lot of farmers have had to you know literally just you know ec you know. Uh, I hate to say terminate, but you know a lot of chickens have died recently, and so there's fewer chickens around to produce eggs, hence the increase in egg prices. And then also of note, uh, fuel prices. So at the outset of the war with Ukraine, so this is February 2022, uh, notice that fuel prices shot up tremendously, 15.7% and 22.3%. Uh, we've seen a come down in fuel prices over the last month or so, which is a, a very good thing. Uh, so energy producers, I, I would expect they, they're more likely to underperform in the next couple of quarters, but uh, we'll see. Okay, so that's that. So what market impact can we expect? Well, we do expect that real GDP growth will slow in 2023 but it will increase or pick back up again in 2024. So my estimate does align pretty well with that of the IMF and a lot of other economists out there. So, you know, in the 2022, our real GDP growth year over year was 2.1%. It's expected to fall to 50 basis points and then pick up again to about 1.2%. Uh, right now, as, as was noted in class, the likelihood of recession is is lower than it was, say, a couple of months ago, but it is still quite high. I think the IMF, I think, was, it pointed out a uh, possibility of recession at like 60%. Uh, I think I'm a bit more optimistic than that, but I guess time will tell. Okay, so that's that. More job tur turnover is expected in 2023. So we do expect that rising wages will hurt retailers. And we could see some labor-intensive employers just uh, be, feel this pinch. So maybe they, they're not able to hire everyone they can, and you know maybe they, they aren't, aren't able to grow their businesses as much as they'd like. Uh, but you know I do expect more turnover as employers, you know they don't want to increase their wages, so employees look elsewhere for that uh, a job with a larger wage. Uh, so you know ex expect more turnover in 2023. Okay, next, real estate firms. So due to higher interest rates, you know, one of the sectors of the economy that is likely to suffer the most is real estate. Uh, you know, commercial real estate, residential real estate, uh, anytime rates rise, people are less willing to take out mortgages, and so this, this could really hurt the real estate industry. Uh, a lot of that pain has been reflected in the price of developers like Lennar, we'll talk about later in this class, but uh, expect real estate firms to suffer in the not too distant future. Also, uh, green technology firms, I expect they could likely outperform. I think with the high energy prices, a lot of people have uh, been more interested in wind and solar. Uh, so I'll, I'll give you my own experience. Uh, my wife and I, we, we just got solar panels installed on our, our roof last Tuesday. Uh, so they, you know, it's very simple procedure, just come out for like two hours and have it done. And I think we're the, the first people in in our neighborhood and probably, you know, within like four neighborhoods who have had it done. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of people out there who are looking at ways to cut energy costs. And this is a good way to do it. Uh, next, flexible employment, absolutely here to stay. So if you're looking for employment, I mean, nowadays, I'd wager that, you know, the maybe not the majority of you in this class, but, at, you know, a, a large minority are likely... Uh, looking at flexible employment, so employment where you don't have to be in the office all the time. So, you know, maybe two days a week you get to work from home, you know, mostly because you're sitting in front of a computer. That's not going anywhere. Zoom is absolutely here to stay. Uh, you know, all the other tools that make that possible are here to stay. Okay, uh, one final thing I, I absolutely need to highlight is shrinking supply chains. Uh, so this is something that's been noted by a lot of analysts, and it's starting to get more attention. But a lot of firms, because of the supp supply chain issues in the last year or so, have started to onshore production jobs in the U.S., basically shrink their supply chain so they don't have to run the risk of, uh, say, a shutdown in China, you know, making them unable to uh, receive supplies that they need to you know, produce their, their end product. 
Uh, okay, so speaking of China, let's talk about the Chinese market. Okay, so uh, first off, the big thing you need to know about China is that uh, they recently had a, a big event happen. So back in, I believe, October, China's president, Xi Jinping, uh, he, he consolidated his power. So he came to power in, I believe, 2013. And historically, since the death of Mao back in the 70s, typically Chinese presidents served two five-year terms. Uh, so Deng Xiaoping, Jiang Zemin, Hu Jintao, and then finally Xi Jinping. Well, the end of Xi's second reign was last October. And the big deal here is that he got a law passed that allowed him to essentially serve as China's president for life. He eliminated the two-term maximum. And so right now, he's, he's effectively consolidated power in China. And uh, since he took, essentially, you know, full power, uh, a lot of policies have changed. Uh, we did see a massive lockdown recently, but... Uh, a couple of weeks ago, China announced that it was removing its zero COVID policy. So uh, now China has kind of been fully unlocked. And the benefit here is that it could lead to increased economic growth and demand for commodities. So there is the potential now that China has removed its zero COVID policy uh, to see I mean, higher commodity prices. So higher oil prices, higher natural gas prices, higher coal prices. Uh, so if we look at the... Uh, China forecast that uh, one of the groups put out. So notice here that up until 2022, they had a fairly high GDP growth rate. 2022, due to all the lockdowns, their GDP growth rate was actually quite low, uh, but it's expected to pick up again because of the end of the lockdowns. Uh, CPI, again, just because you know there wasn't as much spending, uh, we did see a slowdown in inflation in China, but that's again, that's expected to pick back up. Uh, yeah, so that's that's pretty much that. One final thing I'll note about uh, the Chinese market uh, on, on this graphic, uh, the exchange rate. So the exchange rate between the dollar and the yuan is expected to fall. And the reason for this is that uh, if firms are more interested in doing business with Chinese firms, they're going to have to convert their, let's say, dollars or euros into yuan. So there's going to be expected, there's expected to be greater demand for the yuan which pushes the price of the yuan upward and makes you know it you know every yuan worth uh, you know more and more U.S. dollars. So right now the price of yuan per dollar is you know six point nine yuan for every one dollar. That's expected to come down to about six point five by twenty twenty four. Oh, uh, one final thing here. Uh, it what it did make the news that China's population was finally noted as decreasing for the first time. Uh, a large portion of the explanation here is because it's rapidly aging. Uh, the COVID lockdowns really had a, a big impact on uh, a large number of younger people, so millennials and Gen Z. Uh, there's a famous quote out there if you want to look it up. We are the last generation. Thank you. It kind of speaks to all the issues that you know younger people are facing in China. Okay, uh, other things to note, because they, they will end up affecting uh, us in China, uh, real estate developers in China are defaulting, and they have been defaulting for a while. The real estate market in China is one of the, the largest markets on earth, and it's, it's quite frankly one of the biggest bubbles on earth. So back in 2020, uh, the three red lines went into effect, so these are maximum debt levels for real estate developers. If you ex exceed them, you can't borrow any more. So it essentially prevents or prevented developers from borrowing more and becoming more indebted. And a couple of big developers like Evergrande and Kaisa, uh, they actually entered bankruptcy in the case of Kaisa. Uh, Evergrande, I mean, that bankruptcy has been discussed for a long time. And one other issue is that a lot of uh, big transactions in the United, or uh, a, a large percentage of the government funding at the local level in China is financed by land sales. So if you have fewer people buying land uh, just because they they are unable to get a loan or they are unwilling to buy up more property, local government funding dries up. So this is something that's a big issue in China right now. Uh, also, tech firms are now very heavily regulated. So I think everyone's familiar with TikTok. Uh, TikTok, we've seen kind of this crackdown on that and a lot of other companies like Alibaba recently. Uh, China 
there's been a big push since she took over in that uh, tech stocks are being pressured to, one, relist in China. So relist on, say, the Shanghai Stock Exchange uh, or the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. And then two, Chinese policy is making it more difficult to uh, raise new capital if your tech firm isn't aligned with the geopolitical aims of the, the CCP, the, the Communist Party. So, for example, uh, you know, tech firms that produce semiconductors are finding it much more easy to raise money than a company like, oh, uh, ByteDance, for example. So ByteDance is the, the company that produces TikTok. Uh, however, tech firms, if they have international operations, they're not being stifled in any way. There's just been this realignment. Uh, uh, she is trying to make uh, tech firms work for the Chinese government more so than you know what people actually enjoy. So you know, uh, reinforce the the political aims. Okay. Uh, also, China is heavily invested in renewable energy. I mean, uh, there there's been this big push in recent years to you know build EVs. Uh, a lot of the lithium mining occurs in the Xinjiang province of China. Uh, so, you know, basically, you know, there's been this big push in China. A large number of solar panels actually come from China. Okay, so possible market impacts. Uh, so, number one, uh, Chinese real estate market very likely to underperform. We've already started to see this bubble pop in recent months. Basically, uh, it, I know it sounds crazy that I'm saying this, but more people were buying second and third homes, or more homes that were being purchased uh, were second and third homes uh, in recent recent years than they were first homes. Basically, a large number of houses that are being bought up and apartments that are being bought up uh, in the last couple of years were just investment properties. Why? Well, because nobody really trusts the Chinese stock market. Uh, prices are extremely volatile, and you know, property you know, it's, it's seen as more reliable. Uh, but, you know, it is unlikely to underperform, uh, mostly because, you know, fewer people are buying. Uh, next, reorganizations in tech mean that in maybe the medium term, we expect to see stronger competitors to companies like Apple, uh, Alphabet, et cetera. Basically, these firms, these Chinese firms, they're realigning with the CCP's strategic objectives. Uh, I, I will note, though, any firm that's seen as really aligning well with the CCP is, is outperforming uh, the market. Also, commodities used in renewable energy are likely to appreciate in value. So things like lithium, cobalt, these are components that go into the production of batteries and solar panels. Uh, expect prices to increase. And then also expect the price of coal and other uh, commodities that are used in you know, dirty energy are also expected to appreciate now that the lockdowns are more or less over. Okay, and then also we've seen this, this escalation in the production of semiconductors. So uh, essentially chips that go into every piece of technology. So uh, there's essentially this arms race out there. Right now, Taiwan Semiconductor, or TSMC, is the largest manufacturer of essentially uh, transistors or silicon chips. Uh, TSMC historically has sold to both uh, mainland China and U.S. firms, although they've just opened up a, a production facility, I believe, in Arizona. And part of the, the infrastructure package in, uh, or sorry, one of the other recent packages in the U.S., uh, uh, essentially provided funding to Intel and AMD to, to open additional production facilities for semiconductors in the United States, in Arizona and Ohio. In China, they're also investing heavily to essentially build semiconductor produ uh, production lines. And so what we're seeing is that there's this arms race to you know, make sure that semiconductors are produced in, you know, in both the U.S. and China, and then also the EU is getting in on the game. Uh, essentially, there's you know with all the production difficulties with respect to semiconductors, uh, we are see con seeing countries investing heavily in trying to onshore uh, operations. Okay, so that's that. Next, the war in Ukraine. Uh, so as of right now, uh, you, uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin has shown no signs of backing down. If anything, uh, we've seen escalation in recent months. So the U.S. and EU are contributing more war material. So we've seen in recent months, so 
Germany, Poland, France, the UK, the US, all of these countries have pledged munitions and just outright funds. Uh, we've also seen at the same time that Russia is drawing on munitions from uh, other countries. So Iran, it, you know, it made the news in the last couple of weeks that Iranian drones were being used in the war in Ukraine. Uh, North Korean missiles were being used uh, in Ukraine. So Russia, it looks like they may be running out of uh, more advanced technology. Uh, the downside here is that the war is absolutely not over. A, a Russian offensive, uh, I put this bullet point here uh, it, uh, about a couple hours ago before I started recording this video I, and said it is likely in the next few weeks. And uh, just right before I started recording, I, I noted that, oh, hey, there's the offensive might have just begun as of the time I'm recording this. Okay, uh, one other thing I should note here is that uh, a large portion of Russia's economy is tied to the energy and commodities production sector. So uh, if the price of energy, so coal, oil, uh, any uh, commodities that are widely used uh, uh, falls, that could hurt Russia's economy. Uh, the EU just imposed price caps on oil and gas, so you can't sell oil and gas at a price, I think, above $60. What this means is that uh, all, all the additional profit that uh, Russian oil companies were uh, receiving when they sold oil and gas to, say, European companies, uh, that profit is now gone. Now Russian companies are having to sell to oh, places like India, and then Indian companies are selling that oil and gas at a markup to the EU. Uh, next. Russia and China are in the process of building a pipeline to transport gas, natural gas to China, although it looks like that won't be uh, built out for a, a while, several years. Okay, uh, so what else should you know about this? Well, idling in the EU has become common. So if a factory is, you know, let's say they expect higher energy prices, uh, that variable cost they might recognize it as too great to operate. So they might actually shut down a production facility. This has actually been uh, become quite common in the EU. Uh, other things to note, well, in Eastern European countries, uh, so Sweden and Finland, with the war in Ukraine, this really spooked the leadership and the populations of Sweden and Finland. So both of these countries uh, tr have been trying to join NATO. They've got, started the process. However, uh, Turkey has pushed back on Finland joining NATO, and I think Sweden as well, mostly because uh, I believe one of these countries is housing or uh, hosting uh, some Kurdish refugees that the Turkish government uh, accuses of being essentially terrorists. Uh, Ukraine, the Ukrainian leadership has also requested or discussed joining NATO. The benefit here is uh, something called Article 5, which means that if one NATO country is attacked, all other NATO countries, like the US, Germany, uh, the UK, they all go to war to essentially fight whoever attacked that one country. Uh, next, we are noting that production of you know, products that require natural gas or oil, that has slowed and it'll continue to be quite slow uh, for the foreseeable future. So if you have, uh, let's say, a plastic product that requires oh, you know, oil to produce that plastic, chances are you're not going to be able to produce as much because oil prices have gone up and it's harder to you know, get oil. Uh, okay, next, China has threatened to acquire Taiwan. Uh, and you know they've, they've been watching what's happened in Ukraine, which I think has scared off uh, you know, Chinese leadership a little. Uh, and then it was recently announced that the U.S. had just signed a deal for four more bases in the Philippines. Uh, the reason this is important is because, you know, the Chinese government, they're watching what is happening in Ukraine, where you know the, the Russian government tried, tried to acquire a, a smaller state that it had historically occupied, and you know watching how badly it's going. Well, Taiwan is very strategically important, and quite frankly, the, you know, the capture of Taiwan is seen as a, a, I mean, just it, it is the hot spot if I were to wager something that, you know, leads to global war, you know, the capture of Taiwan would probably be it. And so the U.S. signing deals for four more bases in the Philippines is actually, uh, you know, it's it, a first mover event. So it, 
essentially is a signal to the Chinese government, you know, we are still in the area. Uh, so, yeah. And the downside of, you know, war over Taiwan is A, you know, it could go nuclear, but also if there's war in, uh, in Taiwan, you know, we could see trade that goes through the South China Sea, which is like the, a huge percentage of world trade. Uh, it could be restricted, and that means that the production and the transport of semiconductors and oil gets cut off and has to go the long way around, uh, around uh, you know, Africa. So we could see you know, a large portion of world trade be cut off if China does try to invade uh, Taiwan. But I think the, the Ukrainian conflict has kind of you know, made them a little more cautious. Okay, other things that you know, the war in Ukraine could impact. First off, we are seeing more Russian sanctions, not just on uh, Russian authorities, but also on wealthy Russians. Uh, we've seen visa restrictions on Russians. Uh, we've seen increased foreign funding for Ukrainian war efforts, and you know commodity price inflation has eased uh, as you know we we have seen uh, supply chains open up. But with the the ending of the COVID lockdown in China, we could see a, a spike in commodity prices. Uh, uh, one last thing I'll say is that natural gas supplies uh, right now in the EU are not that big of a concern, but next winter they are expected to be a concern because you know. The EU or member states are really running through natural gas like crazy, and it's unclear whether they're going to have the reserves for next winter. So that could be an issue uh, over the next year. So you know, could expect to see a, an increase in the price of oil and gas. Okay, uh, outlook. Well, we are seeing increases in wages in the EU, just like in the US. Uh, rising energy prices are leading to power restrictions, and interest rates are rising across the continent. So I, I think. The group that pointed this, you know, talked about the EU, they did catch some of this uh, with their metrics. So, you know, we are seeing lower GDP expected in 2023, and it should pick back up in 2024, uh, come down in inflation in 2023 and 2024, and then unemployment should remain fairly steady. Uh, real GDP, we do expect to see, uh, you know, a lower metric uh, next or I guess this coming year than you know, at last year. And then, you know, I, I guess you know, that's, that's pretty much it I have to say about uh, uh, that. Okay, so that's that. Uh, developing markets. Okay, so with developing markets, uh, we have seen a couple of things. First off, uh, a large portion of investment in developing markets did slow there's a project out there called the BRI, or the Belt and Road Initiative. This is actually, uh, prior to COVID, this was Xi Jinping, uh, China's president's kind of big project. Uh, it, the idea was invest a trillion or so dollars in, into developing a new Silk Road. So build out railroads to transport Chinese products west, uh, buy up ports or invest in ports like uh, Piraeus, uh, the port of Athens, and then uh, you know use those to transport goods and get Chinese goods out to the rest of the world. Well, the BRI in the last year or so has been accused of being a debt trap. So if you've seen what's happened in Sri Lanka, basically you know the Sri Lankan government was unable to pay back their debt to the Chinese government, and they defaulted, and they had to turn over uh, uh, essentially a, a port to uh, the Chinese government, or really a Chinese uh, state-owned enterprise. Uh, but we have seen emerging markets rally in recent years. Foreign direct investment outside of the BRI has actually increased. We are seeing this resource scramble, particularly in uh, very undeveloped countries that have a large amount of uh, what are called rare earth metals. So cobalt, lithium, uh, some rarer earth el elements than that. Uh, so we've seen just massive investment in recent months. Uh, however, it is very country specific, and it depends on what resource that country has. Uh, one other thing to note: the Arab world is and has been attempting to pivot away from oil and natural gas. So, a lot of the the Arab countries out there, so Saudi Arabia, uh, the UAE, they've put together vision statements and you know essentially roadmaps for how they trans tra transform their economy away from oil. So Saudi Arabia has Vision 2030. They're building the, the line, if you want to look up the line uh, in 
Western Saudi Arabia, it's actually a crazy investment. Uh, you know, we have Abu Dhabi Vision 2030. Qatar is doing all kinds of things. And then uh, all, a lot of these Gulf countries, basically everyone I just mentioned, uh, Kuwait included, uh, because they have a large amount of uh, oil profits, and in the case of Kuwait, uh, natural gas profits, uh, I, I believe every single one of these countries has a sovereign wealth fund. Uh, certainly Saudi Arabia, Qatar, you know, the UAE. Basically, sovereign wealth funds are making massive investments in very blue chip comp blue chip firms and, I mean, in some cases, sports teams worldwide. So, you know, it's essentially a way to buy up a diverse portfolio of assets and hopefully that can offset any losses from people no longer wanting to buy oil, say, 20 or 30 years from now. Okay, so what is the impact? Well, right now, growth stock valuations, so the, the valuations of stocks with uh, very high market-to-book ratios are relatively depressed. And value stocks, I mean, uh, they, they absolutely outperformed growth stocks last year. Uh, that may change because growth stocks are so undervalued or lowly valued relative to historical averages. We'll talk about that later in this class. I'll show you, you know, just how depressed they are. Uh, Arab countries, their Arab economies are expected to perform quite well because natural gas prices and oil prices, even though we've seen a, a, a slight decline in those prices recently, are still quite high. COVID restrictions have ended. Tourism in several of these countries could increase. I mean, a lot of these countries, they're trying to get tourists to come. Uh, and oil production, I mean, it could increase as, you know, let's say the outlook, the global growth outlook improves. So I know a group did put together the global growth outlook, and here it is. So real GDP growth is expected to decline slightly in 2023, but then pick up uh, in 2024. Uh Governments are expected to spend slightly less as percentage of GDP in the next couple of years, but you know inflation it also should come down. So you know we're seeing some pretty good signals right now with respect to future growth, and then also uh, you know CPI. So as long as we're seeing disinflation, that's a pretty good thing. Uh, obviously, we want that to be occurring a little faster. Uh, and then one thing I'll say about this, uh, you know, the emerging markets. Right now, the best firms, the best securities in emerging markets are found really using security selection. Uh, you know, not every firm in emerging markets or listed on a stock exchange in, let's say, the Saudi stock exchange, the Tadawul, uh, is going to be a winner. So really understanding those markets and identifying which securities are going to be outperformers can yield significant alphas. So in the US, it's very difficult to identify stocks. Specific stocks will outperform. In emerging markets, it's a little easier because you have fewer analysts covering those markets, and there's a lot of institutional factors and firm-specific factors that uh, that you know a, a novice or someone who's not in that market wouldn't be familiar with. OK, so finally, what are my expectations for 2023? Well. I do expect deglobalization will continue. That's a big trend that, I mean, a lot of economists are talking about, and I absolutely believe will continue. Basically, the supply, supply chain issues that we've seen for the last year plus, these are causing firms and governments to rethink uh, globalization. And so we've seen this onshoring of production facilities in the U.S., in China, in the EU, uh, other, you know, other nations. So you know, this is a very good thing. And we're starting to move away from a unipolar world to what's called a tripolar world, where the U.S. is not the dominant nation. Instead, you know, we have the EU and we have China, and those are the three big uh, drivers of economic activity in the world. Growth and inflation is, I mean, they are expected to slow in the U.S. and EU, uh, approximately a 50% chance of recession this year, although, you know, the unemployment rate being so low makes me very... Uh, very, very positive about market conditions. Uh, next, growth stocks with good fundamentals, they could outperform value stocks in the next year. So let's say we push through and uh, possibility of recession becomes much less likely. Uh, historically, when there's a bull market, 
coming out of a possible recession, growth stocks significantly outperform value stocks. And so, you know, this is something we might want to consider in the next year or so, you know, con consider uh, increasing our weighting to stocks, you know, growth stocks or stocks exposed to the growth, uh, exposed to the growth factor, uh, or rather, you know, negatively exposed to the value factor. Uh, next, firms that maintain digital models long-term are expected to outperform. I mean, these firms, like I said, they're not going back to in-person operations. I mean, firms that are, you know, that allow people to work from anywhere, they're likely to continue to allow people to work from anywhere. And then finally, commodity producers, I would expect them to perform quite well. I mean, lithium, cobalt, rare earth metals, these are in extremely high demand. I think I'm not alone in wanting solar panels. I think a lot of people look at the price of energy and say, yeah, I want solar panels on my home. Okay, with that, I'm going to bring this video to a close. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Uh, this is really my take. Uh, you know, I think I'm right, but you know, I'm a little biased here. So this is why we, we always like to have conversations. Uh, so this is something I'll bring up again and again as we go forward and as you're valuing individual securities. And I, I hope you got something out of this. Thank you.